All right, everybody, welcome again to another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. I'm your host, Phil Huber. Today, I'm joined, as always, by John Doyle and Logan Whitmer. And on today's episode, we're going to be talking about buying tools, kind of a spinoff from last week, and uh, when to buy used tools, buy new tools, or buy premium tools. So let's get things started. This episode of the Shop Notes podcast is brought to you by Woodsmith Magazine. Woodsmith Magazine has been the trusted source for all your woodworking information for over 40 years. From tips and techniques to furniture projects to shop projects, you'll find it all at Woodsmith Magazine. Subscribe today at woodsmith.com. You know, we get questions like this kind of frequently that come in uh, through the through the emails and internets about buying tools, tool recommendations, all that kind of stuff. And I think part of this topic also for me comes from the seminar that you did today, Logan, on yeah. tuning up or fixing up hand planes. Because I feel like that's kind of a jumping off point for a lot of people in terms of probably the used tool market. Mm-hmm. And I think we're in America, we're pretty conditioned to buying new power tools for the most part, especially yeah. if you're just starting off. So what kind of, well, let's put it this way. What do you guys have for used tools versus power versus new tools? I think most of the stuff I have here was used that I got from auctions from, from work. So at least I knew who it was being used by beforehand. <laughs> Probably me. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess um, for me, getting used tools, I guess just kind of knowing what you're getting into before you get into it. Um, like as far as power tools, um, if it's got a good motor on it and electrical, that's that's kind of what I'm looking for. If it's got some surface rust and it's not like the cast iron isn't pitted or anything, I mean, that doesn't bother me. That can be cleaned up. Most of the stuff can be cleaned up. But, the, you know, paint dings here and there doesn't really affect the the, the usage of the tool um, or whatnot. So I guess it's just it's having good bones to it and, and going from there and, and having a little bit of knowledge of kind of what needs tuned up, I guess. So. Uh, what do you guys think? You know, so I I started, and everybody's heard me say this, started buying and selling hand tools, right? I started I started buying antique tools for myself is where I started. And that's where I, I started buying or building my hand tool library. Um, as far as hand tools go, I love I love vintage hand tools. Don't get me wrong. I love premium hand tools. I mean, I got Lee Nielsen sitting behind me. I got blue spruces in the cabinet. I love them. Um, However, there's kind of a romance about using old tools because it's something that somebody else has used. It has stories behind it. You know, like it's, it's one of those old, if this cool tool could talk, you know, what would it say? You know, like what projects has it built? You know, I mean, that's, that's super cool to me. It's super cool to think about. Uh, as far as power tools go, though, I'm I I guess I don't buy used power tools, and there's no reason for that. Um, I take that back. Um, my jointer and my planer that I had um, that I have since sold, I bought those used, and they were great. Um, like John said, as long as it has good bones, you know, no rust, no. Um, obvious issues with it and and we're spoiled today with with the internet and the amount of knowledge available you can go on and say you know hey i'm looking at a dewalt 735 here's the things to look out for when buying a used one you know you can find that sort of information around um so you know i'm not terribly concerned about buying larger power tools used um so like john said i I got my bandsaw from one of our auctions and i have a drill press in here i got from one of our auctions from from work that just we uh, were upgrading some of our look for our photo studio and went up buying the used ones um i have no problem with that uh as as long as it has good bones good motor um no obvious issues and most issues can be fixed on larger power tools um 
I don't think I've ever, I have looked, but I've never purchased small power tools used. Um, and I think it goes to your point, Phil, we're conditioned to buy new, right? Right. Um, but like one of the, actually one of the things sitting on my bench behind my computer right now is is a, a newer belt sander that I bought. Um, I looked, I did look used on Facebook and Craigslist and stuff to see if I could find a used belt sander. Cause it's just not something I use a lot of. Um, and I wanted, I didn't want to spend a ton on it. I needed it for one specific task. And there's been others in the past where I've said, Oh, it'd be, it'd be great to have a belt sander. Um, but the price difference between buying a used one when somebody wanted, you know, 75 or a hundred bucks for a used one that it looks like they did belt sander races with it. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> or, or like it was like, why does a drywaller need a belt sander? There's drywall dust <laughs> all over it. Mm. Um, so there is some like, there's some additional money to buy a new smaller power tool like that, but not a ton. So yeah. I guess that's that's where I fall. Now that being said, I do know many woodworkers that often sell power tools, and I would have no problem from buying one from a fellow woodworker that I know is taking care of their tools. Right. And you can usually tell too. That, oh, sure. That whether a tools being, has been taken care of. And mm -hmm. So, cause I was thinking that I look around my shop here, you know, like the first table saw that I bought was brand new. Partially cause I really wanted to get a table saw. So I got a $99 bench top saw from the box store. And I mean, it worked like a $99 saw, but it was new. And I guess I looked at it from the comfort fact that if there was something wrong with it, I had a real receipt from a real store and I mm -hmm. could take it back. Whereas if you buy something used, especially without a lot of experience, you know, it's like, how do you even begin to know what you're looking at or for or why or, you know, because there's been some pretty grungy looking use power tools that really only need a good cleaning and yeah. they're fine. But then there's also use power tools that look good that are all hosed up on the inside with shot bearings or burned out motors and stuff like that. So, you know, cause like my planer is the DeWalt 735 and I bought that new cause I knew that that was the planer that I wanted and I want something, wanted something that was really nice. But like my drill press and my bandsaw are both used that I got from a, a former coworker. But again, I knew who he was and could kind of see what the tool was like. And it was more like at that price, I really couldn't go wrong. You know, you could always try it out, see what's going on with it. And if it doesn't work out, it's not that big, big of a deal for a loss on it. So... Mm -hmm. But like most of my portable power tools, like my sander, drill, routers, those I all have new. Yeah. Except for like my little circular saw. I got that one used at a garage sale. Um, got the garage sale. And then my biscuit joiner was my dad's when he upgraded. So, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting because, um, there are, I, you hit a certain level of tool, I feel like, and then it just holds its value, right? Like, I'm not going to go out and buy a um, Harbor Freight circular saw and then turn around and sell it after two months for 80% of what I paid for it. I'll probably sell it for 30% of what I paid for it, right? <laughs> um, which is like $4 then. Um, <laughs> but when you look at like used fest tools, for example, mm -hmm. and it's funny, it's something that I, I see on these forums a lot. Fest tool seems to resell for about 80% of its new price, which is, that's phenomenal, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you right. buy a, you know, I don't know how much like the Capex is. Let's say it's $600 and you use it for a year and then you turn around and sell it for 520 bucks. That's a pretty good investment. I mean, for getting yeah. use out of it. But I feel like there's other things like that. Um, Lee Nielsen's, those are the same way. 
you know, the, the Lee Nielsen number seven was a couple hundred dollars. And I think I could probably get close, not exactly what I paid for it, but I could get real close where oh, yeah. I've got my, I've got my use out of it. So I feel like there's that different gradation of tool um, quality that hold their value. Now finding a buyer for them can be tricky, tricky, but when you do find a buyer, they're willing to pay it. So, right. It's just, it's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah. But I think even with other power tools, you know, if you think of, you know, your standard used drill press, they're all going to be round about the same price, almost regardless of who makes it. Yeah. Except for the, you know, bargain basement ones where those yeah. are going to be, you know, free or it's going out on spring cleanup at the curb kind of a thing, mm -hmm. you know, cause it's, it don't like, it almost doesn't matter whether it's an old Rockwell drill press or a Powermatic or, you know, craftsman or whatever, if it's of a certain vintage, they're all about the same price, you know, it becomes a commodity at that point. So what tools out there can I buy that will go up in value? <laughs> Uh, to invest <laughs> the ones made out of toilet paper right now yeah no i don't i think the the new run on stuff other than toilet paper is um playground equipment i found yeah it's hard getting swings and slides and all that stuff that i'm working on the the, the playhouse stuff outside I found that I had to drive uh, 60 miles to, to get the slide that I needed. Oof. It was the only one in the state. The next one, uh, I think, was in Minnesota that I would have had to go get. Wow. And I had a hard time finding swing hangers and different things. So that's where it's at right now. Stock up. Get it while I you can. Guess. Right. So I guess to, to build on to this, at what point do you say I buy a vintage tool because the ones I can buy today are not as good as those? You know, this this kind of stems from my uh, the seminar I did earlier today, which was um, the hand planes because the, the vintage Stanleys are as good as most of them made today. I would argue that the Veritas and Lee Nielsen's are probably a little bit better just because right. of manufacturing controls today, um, but. Another example is when I was talking to you guys before we started this was the I was watching a guy do a vice showdown on YouTube yesterday and he he built a custom one. The guy owns like a machine shop or runs a machine shop or whatever. He built a custom one that was very nice and withstood everything he threw at it. Um, the one of the top three was like a vintage Buffalo Forge bench vice. I mean, the thing looks like it, it looked like it weighed 4,000 pounds. Um, <laughs> but he's like, when I bought it, I had to tear it apart and spend a week basically restoring it because it was beat to crap. Right. Is, I mean, how, how do you guys weigh that? Like, Hey, I'm gonna have to spend time with this, but I know I'm going to end up with a quality mm -hmm. product at the end versus going out and say, spending, you know, 150 bucks on a Wilton. Right. Yeah, we'll probably get the job done, but not just just not be as nice. Yeah. Um, I almost hate to say it, but it's probably going to come down to cost for me sure. on a lot of things because mm -hmm. I just, you know, I'm just not going to spend. I come from a long line of very thrifty German farmers, <laughs> so their uh, their blood runs through my veins and I'm just not going to spend a ton of money on things. So I would, yeah. if I can get a decent, a decent tool and put a moderate investment into it, you know, mm -hmm. where it's not something that I have to, you know, basically strip down to its carcass and then rebuild from the inside, you know, but it's mostly mm -hmm. elbow grease on my part of cleaning removing rust, maybe repainting, you know, tuning up different things. But if I'm going to have to spend a lot of money on new bearings or, you know, the powertrain essentials or something like that, then mm -hmm. I'm probably going to avoid that. Sure. So you put more value on uh, the upfront budget purchase versus time you might have to put into it. Right. 
Right. But sure. I also look at it at the fact that, you know, I'm doing this for my own enjoyment and as a yeah, hobby. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So mm-hmm. there's, and, you know, I've come to really, you know, I really thought when I first got into woodworking that it was all about building the projects, making the furniture, having it in your house, whatever. And I realize now that my personality is, I enjoy the making almost more than the completed project. And having worked here and at shop notes, I really enjoy making tools. Yeah. And, and, and when I, when I have tools that I fix up, it's almost the same thrill as making the tool. Sure. On, you know, cause like the drill press that I have and the bandsaw that I have, you know, like the bandsaw, I made a fence for it cause it didn't come with a fence. And it's like, the tool really isn't mine until I've modded it somehow, you know, mm-hmm. just, you know, whether it's cleaning it up or putting a V belt on it or making a new stand for it or whatever it's, mm-hmm. there's a, there's a high level of satisfaction in the doing of it and then using that tool afterwards. So, and again, cause I'm not a professional, it, I don't rely on it for income. So I can, I'm going to accept the fact that this is maybe not as capable of a tool, but I'm not doing it every day. Sure. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not, these tools get occasional use, sometimes heavier than others, depending on the time of year or whatever. But, you know, I'm not relying on these to be running in top shape every day, every week. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'd have to agree with Phil as a hobbyist. It's kind of fun just getting a new tool and kind of messing around with it and, and getting it to work properly, just as fun as it is, you know, using it to, to create a project or, you know, it's just, you know, part of the enjoyment of the hobby, I guess, is, is tinkering around with, with tools and, and your stuff. Yeah. So. And I think Logan, you've found this with your uh, tool middleman that you've become is that there's kind of a thrill in finding too, like hunting oh. and finding, you right. know, like I've, yeah. There's tools that I, I mean, I have some on, I keep a wish list of tools that would be fun to have, but then I've had some on that list and it's like, holy crap, I just found this Stanley router plane that just looks super sweet. You know, you just can't beat the looks of it and I can get brand new blades from Veritas for it. So I'm not really out anything and, you know, sort of be able to come across something like that. Yeah, I, I would say the thrill of the hunt is probably what keeps me doing it. You know, I mean, you know what I mean? It's just because it's fun to to pick up something and be like, you know, I know somebody's really going to need this. Not, not need it, but they're going to really appreciate it. Like, they've been looking for a good number five. Uh, yeah. And I just rescued this one out of somebody's barn, and that's awesome. And, yeah, there's there's absolutely a a finding thrill um out of i mean not only tools but like being able to yank a log out of the woods and cut lumber out of it you know there's there's definitely that the hunt is always there so yeah you know and it's funny because i i asked that question because personally i'm kind of on both sides of the line because i really enjoy you know like my blue spruce stuff it's a well-engineered well-built tool and i can appreciate for that and i enjoy the beauty of it and the work that went into it you know um but on the same hand i i feel like stuff that was manufactured a hundred years ago um is is was built to a higher standard than we have today you know what i mean so it's like grabbing a hand plane that somebody actually cared when they built it you know that's I, I love that because you have this, you have the same level of care and engineering that went into that, but I might just have to bring it back to life. Right. So. Well, I think the, even the bringing back to life or the rescuing aspect of it, or, you know, finding a hidden gem is mm-hmm. there's a satisfaction in that too. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. A couple of the guys that I actually, my wife hates YouTube, which is funny because we do a lot on YouTube. <laughs> and and that's she why she hates, hates it. That's yeah. why she hates it. She hears Phil and John and I too much on TV. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, there's she likes some of the 
doesn't like it, but she puts up with if I'm cooking and I flip YouTube on. Uh, the ones she doesn't mind listening to are uh, there's a couple of guys I follow that do hand tool restorations, like hand tool rescue, uh, stuff like that. Those channels that there's no talking. It's just somebody fixing something. And she's like, that's kind of Zen. It's like, yeah, it is. It's like, you know what? Do you, am I going to go out and buy a 1875 Russian flamethrower and restore it? No, (laughs) but I want to know how. (laughs) Yeah. So when you're buying tools, at what point, I'm going to point this one at you first, Logan, partially because you brought it up last week in justifying the mechanics tool set for your sawmill. Now, you admitted that you were going to get the sockets and wrenches and screwdrivers or whatever at Harbor Freight. Mm -hmm. But like you just said, you have a saw stop and blue spruce tools and Lee Nielsen tools. Where... And how do you choose the premium versus the mid-range versus the budget? That's an interesting question. Um, Personally, so looking around in my shop, the only, so woodworking is, I mean, yeah, it's our jobs, but it's also our enjoyment, right? So, Looking around in my shop, I don't have hardly any Harbor Freight things in here except for a handful of their clamps. And their clamps are good, um, good enough, which may be the underlying thing here is, is good enough. Um, their aluminum bar clamps are fairly inexpensive, um, and I, I bought a bunch of them a number of years ago, and they're fine. I mean, they, they work great. Um, there's some other stuff I buy at Harbor Freight, like their, their gloves and uh, acid brushes, Um and some of their, I have some of their drill bits, like left-handed drill bits and easy outs and stuff. Uh, the stuff I don't use every day, uh, which I guess is, that's where I'm getting at, is the stuff I don't use every day, I'm okay buying at Harbor Freight. Um, sure. and there is some stuff at Harbor Freight that is pretty good, like their mechanics tools, their Pittsburgh brand, it's lifetime warranty. So if it breaks, I just bring it in and get a new one. Um, like my saw stop, I use it almost every day. You know what I mean? And I, I get enjoyment out of that well, well-built well machine. The Blue Spruce tools, I, I use those a lot, and I get enjoyment out of them. Same thing with the, the Lee Nielsen stuff. Um, if it's an occasional use tool, Harbor Freight's my go-to. Uh, okay. uh, just for um, the simple fact of the, I mean, the price. It comes down to the price. Um, like, I, I buy a fair amount of mechanics tools from them like uh, spring compressors for doing the the rear coil springs in my truck it's like i'm not gonna go out and buy a snap on one or you know even go spend 20 bucks to rent one when i can buy one for 22 bucks and have it on hand the next time i need to use it in 15 years you know what i mean right uh so it's like i guess that occasional use stuff um i'm okay going to Harbor Freight. Mid-range is stuff that I'm using more often, um, like my my cordless, my drills. Um, I wouldn't call, I have the Ryobi One Plus series for my cordless tools. Okay, yeah. I would not call those, I would definitely call those mid-range, right? They're not Harbor Freight, sure. mm-hmm. no. but they're not expensive like the high-end DeWalt's or, or you know, uh, no, Milwaukee's or, something or like yeah, that. exactly. Uh, and they do the job, I love them. Um, I don't use them every day, but I, I like them. Um, the table saw, I use that m- most days. Uh, my chisels, my planes, I use those most days. Um, so I guess that's where I where I make that transition. Although I have been using the crap out of and I know somebody's going to write in, and I'm going to be disappointed if somebody doesn't. Uh, I have been using the Harbor Freight 80-volt cordless chainsaw a ton the battery is this it's like putting a car battery into it and it's amazing <laughs> i love it like i went out this weekend and i sawed a hickory for a guy okay and we got i got about halfway through the log and i got one knot that started hitting one of my guides and i stopped the saw went to my truck 
pulled out this chainsaw and the guy just his his face is like oh really like this kid's gonna use this <laughs> and it zipped through it so fast he's like oh my god that's cool and i was like yeah I, you know i just, i dropped 40 <laughs> trees in my backyard with it but, so it's kind of like the moped of power tools it's, it's, like all funny, <laughs> it's all funny games until your friends see using one but then they want to write it <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, so Funny. John, what do you have Harbor Freight wise? Uh, I don't. Uh, I was gonna add the kind of same thing as you is like just uh, you know very uh, uncommon use tools that it, I don't use very often. But I find it more just to add on to that that it's like recently uh, I needed a pair of ten snips and I know I have a pair of ten snips somewhere <laughs> and I could not find them. So it's like oh, I'll just go buy a, a cheap pair. For, to use right now and then, and then i'll find that that other pair someday but you know right. usually like when you get back just need it right now yeah it's like oh here it is underneath this yeah. pile of lumber that i just mm -hmm. got through so there's a lot of that where it's like either i don't use it very often or i just need it like real quick and i know i have another good one somewhere but i just got to get through this job and and that kind of thing so well you know it's funny because that is a completely valid point there's certain tools that I buy all the time that are dirt cheap. And I end up with like 45 pipe cutters because it's <laughs> like I go to Menards and buy the 299 one because I know I have a bunch of them. And yeah. then at some point, you know, I bought a nice like Husky one from Home Depot. And yeah, mm. that's, that's funny because, yeah, same thing. I, I do that too. Yeah, I would agree on that. And I also, you know, like the so you have the occasional use tools where it's essentially a permanent rental. Mm -hmm. You know, you just, it's, you have it mostly for the convenience of having it. It's not something that you're uh, depending on, but then I'll also do discount versions of things that are expendable or consumables, you know, like twist drill bits. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. you're going to use them on metal and plastic and they're going to get gunked up and I'm not going to sharpen them. I'm just going to put them back in the drawer, let them sharpen themselves, and then come mm -hmm. back out and use them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like a twist bit, you'll use it, gets dull, you chuck it. You know, where I will spend money on is like a nice set of Brad Point bits or yeah. Forstner bits. And then leave the, you know, the ones that are going to get beat up more mm -hmm. for a lower end brand or whatever. So, yeah, I found that um, it's not a a tool per se but something that i spend overspend on maybe is uh good screws as i'm building <laughs> this playhouse because it's like i've had bad screws where they just like either snap right. off or uh just strip out it's like i, I don't want to mess with that so i usually like buy expensive screws and and just go with it and sorry kids you could have gone to college but Right, yeah, I needed but your deck is screws. still, but your playhouse yeah. is still standing. Right, Which, the wood has all rotted around it, but and I use a lot of them too. I use a lot of screws, <laughs> about twice as many as anybody else. So, I mean, that's Not it's funny, around. but it's true, right? Like, I'm guilty of using drywall screws on wood projects before, and it's a freaking terrible idea. So it's like. Then you have like the upgraded like hundred count box. Yeah, they're okay. I've been buying the. Um, looking at the, the SPACs, S-P-A-X yeah. brand. Yeah, nice. yeah. Those are pretty good. And they're actually fairly inexpensive. Um, and they don't now seem they to, are, yeah. yeah, they don't seem to splinter as much as other stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm just laughing because it's true. I mean, yeah, you spend money on good screws. I started spending some money on epoxy too. And I find that good epoxy is better than not good epoxy. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So finish is another one yeah what's the uh, the other brand mm -hmm. of screws like grk or yeah yep. or, right that's what i got see yep. yep and the funny part is is like spax and grk which i would call like really nice screws because i will spend money on nice screws yet they're at menards yeah which yeah. i yeah. you know no offense to menards i shop there frequently but that's not usually the store that has the reputation for, hey, these are the cool, really nice 
fasteners, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. See, I didn't realize Menards had that like reputation because when I grew up in Cedar Rapids, that's all we had. We only had a Menards. Yeah. And everyone's mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, the discount tool store you guys have down there, the Menards. It's like, what? <laughs> like, Home Depot is better? Is that what you're telling me? I don't believe that. No, not necessarily, <laughs> but. But anyway, that's just, yeah. So there are consumables that I'll use that are, that I'll go with the low end on because I know that I'm not going to. It's like almost no matter what brand you get, you're still not going to get a lot of yeah. life out of it. So. I would say finish is another one, right? Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. and uh, actually, I'm just working on an article for this issue uh, on sandpaper. Sandpaper is another one. Like, the Harbor Freight sandpaper sucks. It's cheap sandpaper, and it cuts like cheap. It doesn't cut like cheap sandpaper. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, and that's, I guess that's one of the, the bigger things I've got from working at Woodsmith is we use Merca and we have some bot random boxes of Festool and Norton floating around. Yeah. Quality sandpaper is it's head and shoulders above a non-quality sandpaper. Right. Merca. I always pronounce it America. I, yeah, I, <laughs> I knew that joke was coming. <laughs> the joke was made a lot when we were doing phone. Waiting phone. for that one. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So how's the uh, backyard skyscraper? It's it's going up. We had a little pause this week for it didn't really rain so much as it just kept every other day kept misting and and right. whatnot. So I, I need to do painting and staining and stuff, I think, before I get the the roof on. Well, I got all of the like siding and everything up and I got it up and I was like, gosh, I should have painted that maybe before I put it up. Then I wouldn't have to trim around it. So maybe I'll take it back down and paint it. I don't know. So yeah. So I, I, to the painting and then roofing and a little bit of trim work and we're there. So sweet. But got the swing set up so the kids are able to swing and wear so out it's the a soft, soft and, opening for it. Yeah. Yep. So, but yeah. So here's a question so for you because I'm not a, yeah. I'm not a native Iowan like mm -hmm. you two are. Mark is usually kind of a crappy month because it could mm -hmm. just as easily get 14 inches of snow as be 40 degrees and foggy the whole time. Mm -hmm. April usually is the month that gets your hopes up because things start to leaf out. You get some flowers blooming. Mm -hmm. Birds are chirping. And then May breaks your heart like every year because you, like, mm -hmm. you get like a couple of days where it's 74 and sunny and everybody's outside biking and jogging and going for walks and then, then you, you get, get like 21 days of rain or cloudy yeah. or yeah it's like what the heck mother nature i thought we were cool yeah it <laughs> sucks. Go, go and do that and i yeah because we I had have... some days in march that were really nice and then yeah I say I've I have turkey hunted in May in the snow before, which is ridiculous. I mean, turkey hunting's supposed to be like green foliage, leafy, nice mosquitoes right. eating you alive. Sure. But nope. Do you got anything else that you're working on, John? Now that you're, uh, no. Or that's what's next? Up, taking up. Yeah, that is the question. What's next? I'm. I feel like after this, I'm gonna have to do something on the house that makes my wife happy because it's like I had all these projects that I hadn't finished in the house and she's like oh you're home on quarantine you can get all these house projects done and now I've just been out in the garage and just randomly building playhouses and squirrel <laughs> picnic tables <laughs> can crushers uh, just yeah just nonsensical stuff and she's just like what the heck's going on so I feel like I should circle back around to finishing them up some of those projects she knows what she married i know, I know. <laughs> that's what i tell her I like, I, you know i was like this when we got married yeah but i haven't changed it at all change it's me. been you yeah yeah she thought she could fix me but here we are now Jokes there's just her. more of me yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's the one that needed fixed <laughs> yeah that's right <clears throat> so 
How about you guys? What are you working on? Well, I'm wrapping up my uh, router table, the compact router table. I've been deliberate on it because I really want it to turn out nice. And mm -hmm. I've also decided to paint sections of it. And that always ends up making things take longer because you got, you know, masking off different areas to get painted and then waiting for that coat to dry. And then when it's cool and damp outside, the paint doesn't dry super fast, oddly enough. So, mm -hmm. and then I want to do exactly. some uh, gel varnish on the, router table surfaces and some exposed plywood sections that I have. So, And then I'm working on uh, my shoulder plane. There's my mm -hmm. blank that I've started to sand down, which I had been told by people wouldn't take that long, but uh, <laughs> we're letting I you down have, gently. <laughs> I've only, I have one side. It's all that, that cheap I'm, sandpaper. It's yeah. It's all the cheap sandpaper, right? <laughs> <laughs> One side that I'm getting close to being done on, I believe, and it's hard to say. So it's mm -hmm. it's not going too bad, but I feel like it's taking a little bit longer than I had hoped, which sure. isn't necessarily a bad thing. But yeah, we'll see. I'm kind of I'm yeah. I feel like I'm to the point now where I have some time invested on it, so it's on. Like, yeah. We're going all the way. It's funny. I, uh, I I feel like I got some affirmation today. Uh, so I dropped off the other day uh, that miter plane that I built um, with uh, on Chris's desk uh, so he could start modeling it. So we will be able to get art for it for the next issue. And he's like, I got it home and I had it. It's like, I couldn't resist. I had to use it. He's like, and there's <laughs> wispy shavings all over. The thing works amazing. And I was like, yes, I feel like I got some affirmation. I got, I got my Chris Fitch blessing on the hand plane. <laughs> right. Which is what I was really striving for. I don't, we don't even need to publish it now. Yeah. I just, I wanted Chris's yeah. blessing on it. You're um, done. <laughs> yeah. No. So now I have to make another one that works as good or better. So. But I feel bad because my, my poker table has been like, not, it's not my poker table. I don't play poker. Uh, but this poker table I've been building has been sitting in my living room down here for like a week now uh, because I set it up. Um, so the, the lady I'm building it for, for her husband, uh, could come out and look at it and give me a couple of, I had some questions on finish and I just wanted to get some final details done before I started spraying lacquer and stuff. And it's been sitting out there. She came over Tuesday last week, and it's been sitting there since. And it's Thursday, the following week. Uh, I feel like I have a good excuse. I had to order a four center bit, okay? Because in the top, the top's big eight inch wide walnut, I'm putting some cup holders. I ordered stainless steel cup holders from AmericanGamingSupply.com, which happens to be like a poker table supply website. Who knew there was such a thing? Uh, but they're stainless steel cup holders. The problem is they require a massive hole, right? I mean, if you think about a beer bottle or a uh, can or, you know, just a normal like drink can, they're fairly big. Um, but these things require a two and three quarter inch hole. So I have to order a forcener bit that for everybody looking can, uh, watching this can see. I ordered this, you know, talking about cheap stuff. Um, the only two and three quarter inch four center bit I could find uh, in stock was this Steelix brand. Okay. Oh, yep. And we've used them before. Sure. Um, I I actually have a couple of their bits, and I can't remember if they're good or not. Uh, I don't feel like I blacklisted them in my head, so I'm hoping it will work for the eight holes I have to drill. But this guy was it's two and three quarter inch. It was twenty nine bucks. Okay. The next cheapest one I found was, I think maybe from infinity cutting tool at like $129. Sure. So I'm like, mm, is like I can it make money on this poker table or I can't? Yeah, exactly. So it's, yeah. So it's like, well, I might just have to take my Dremel to this and just sharpen the crap out of it and hope that that helps. I was going to say, cause I had a, I helped a friend of mine, um, make some holders for some products that he sells for uh, like beard oil. Yeah. Stuff. Um, 
And he had that same brand for a big Forstner bit. And like the first few holes work out okay, but I found that if you take a diamond hone to the mm-hmm. ramps on it, it yeah. can make it makes a huge difference. Yeah. And then and also yeah, drill a clearance hole. Like if you can oh, oh, if you have like a edge. if you have like well, not only that, but even just like a you know, like a if you had a decent inch or inch and a quarter Forstner mm-hmm. bit and you just plow out the middle and then yeah. that just removes that much more mm-hmm. material that 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 the big Forstner bit doesn't have to deal with. Sure. Yeah, and that would probably help. I mean, and I have some I have some uh uh files for augers. Oh yeah. That I might be able to get some of these teeth. Um so sure. it's just it's just funny because it's like that's a big old bit. Now I gotta figure out a way to hold it and make these, you know, plumb holes. But yeah, so that and to be honest, I was kind of not doing a ton of work on the poker table because I was waiting for the force in our bit because I want to do the tr- cup holders and I'm doing some shallow like dishes in there for like chips, phones, stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to do that if it ever stops raining. I'm going to do it outside because the oh, route sure. of those things just is a mess. But um, I keep telling myself I was trying not to bring it back in the shop because I knew I had to do that seminar today and I didn't want my shop to be messy. <laughs> Smart. So that's why. So yeah. So yeah, hopefully maybe next week I'll have a picture of a finished poker table. All right. So we'll see. All right. All right. Now I had, there was a question and I don't remember who it's from. I don't have the email here in my shop to pull it up, but the question was regarding your reference Logan of buying and fixing up and reselling tools. <clears throat> what do you use to clean tools? Uh, like just metal tools. Yeah, so you get you, hand planes and, you know, the accessories and whatever that you've been buying and reselling. What are you using to clean the gunk off? Or, or... Um, so I was using, I'm looking at the bottle right now, uh, for standard cleaning, Simple Green works pretty well. It has some citric acid in it, though, and it seems to etch. John likes the CMT orange CMT tools. orange clean. tools. Yep. Oh, Formula like bit and blade cleaner. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I like use that. For, Stop the shelf. You use that for just about everything, though, John. I mean, it's not just like yeah. cleaning saw blades and stuff. Yeah. Toothpaste. I mean, <laughs> it's the hydro oxychloroquine of, uh, of tool cleaners. <laughs> He's going to get us in trouble. Disinfecting. <laughs> Whatever. Again. Um, I bought stock. <laughs> right. Uh, otherwise, I found this off-brand stuff at Menard's called Mr. Green. Okay. It's just a degreaser. It doesn't have mm-hmm. citric acid in it, which citric acid is what's in Simple Green, and that can, it can and will soften Japanning. So yeah. if I soak a hand tool like a like a Japan uh, blade or a hand tool bed in Simple Green, the Japaning will actually start coming off if you leave it oh, for okay. a day or two. Um, sure. But that Mister Green does not, and it works really well. Uh, so I like that for my wood body stuff. I use turpentine mixed with um, some mineral oil, a little bit of mineral oil, uh, oh, okay. and or um, straight turpentine i've used straight turpentine before too and that works well uh, but then i always hit it with let's see if i can reach it without pulling my earbuds out uh alfie shine uh for wood oh, yeah. body stuff um it it's technically like a resin wax uh, but it works really well as a cleaner too so oh okay it, it, probably it kinda, just enough of a solvent in there that it yeah buffs off stuff okay yeah, because I've used that uh, for rusty stuff. I don't have a bottle of it out here with me. The little pump sprayer, the Rust Away or whatever yeah. it's called. It's the red and white <laughs> bottle. Because um, I'll use that on rusty stuff. And that I'm kind of surprised on how well that removes rust, you know, without yeah. having to deal with, like, electrolysis or, 
going crazy with a wire brush or something like that. For rusty stuff, I've been using that uh, Evaporust. Oh, okay. And I think that works really nicely. Yeah. It's, it stinks. Uh, there must be some sort of sulfur content in it because it smells like a egg fart. So. <laughs> mm, that sounds good. <laughs> I know. I think I saw that on the Amazon reviews. Yeah, I think yeah. so. <laughs> John, you got anything to add, add to that? No, I think that's a, that's a walk-off right there. That's a wrap. <laughs> I embarrass myself on these. <laughs> Good thing nobody listens to this. I know, right? right? Just for us. It's just for us. Uh, okay, well, I think that wraps up today's episode of the Shop Notes podcast. If you enjoyed listening to it, please forward the podcast to another woodworker and also leave a review and a five-star rating wherever you listen to your podcasts so that this show can get out to more woodworkers like you. Uh, the more ratings that we get, the more people get to see it and we get to uh, talk about woodworking with a wider audience. Uh, if you'd like to see more of what we've been talking about, there's a video version. You can find that on our episode notes page at woodsmith.com. Dot com. You'll be able to find a link there for the podcast and all the podcast episodes. Uh, and we're also on YouTube where you can see the video version of this. So thanks again, and we'll see you again next time for the Shop Notes Podcast. This episode of Shop Notes Podcast is brought to you by Woodsmith Magazine. Woodsmith Magazine has been trusted source for all your woodworking information for over 40 years. From tips and techniques to furniture projects to shop projects. You can find it all in Woodsmith Magazine. Subscribe today at woodsmith.com.